Welcome to everyone participating in this Trenching and Excavation WebEx presented by OSHA Training Institute Region 6, Education Centers Mid-South, Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Texas at Arlington. OSHA Education Centers provide valuable safety and health training and outreach services to people across the country in helping OSHA to achieve its mission of protecting America's workers. While OSHA sets forth standards regarding workplace safety, it's important to note we all play a role in helping to prevent workplace injuries and illnesses each and every day. It is through our combined efforts that we will be successful in reducing injuries and illnesses. This webinar raises awareness among both workers and employers about common hazards in trenching and excavation and how they can be prevented. A message from U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta. The United States Department of Labor is committed to the safety of the American workforce. If you work around trenches or excavations, here are five things you should know to stay safe. Ensure there's a safe way to enter and exit. Trenches must have cave-in protection. Keep materials away from the edge of the trench. Look for standing water or atmospheric hazards. Never enter a trench unless it's been properly inspected. These safety tips can save lives, including yours. To report an unsafe trench, call 1-800-321-6742. For more information on trench safety, visit www.osha.gov. This is a message from United States Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta. Because of the continuing incidence of trench excavation collapses and accompanying loss of life, the agency has determined that these work sites continue to warrant an increased enforcement presence. OSHA has long maintained that employees exposed to potential cave-ins must be protected before the excavation phase is in imminent danger of collapse because OSHA believes that there is a potential for a collapse in virtually all excavations. Trenching and excavation work exposes workers to extremely dangerous hazards. According to the Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries data published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 130 fatalities recorded in trenching and excavation operations between 2011 and 2016. The private construction industry accounted for 80% or 104 of those fatalities. An alarming 49% of those construction fatalities occurred between 2015 and 2016. In summary, of the 104 fatalities in this industry, OSHA believes that the rate of deaths and serious injuries resulting from trenching and excavation incidents, mostly collapses, can be significantly reduced if OSHA concentrates resources to effectively engage trenching and excavation operations through both enforcement and compliance assistance activities. Excavation and trenching are among the most hazardous construction operations. OSHA defines an excavation as any man-made cut, cavity, trench, or depression in the earth's surface formed by earth removal. A trench is defined as a narrow underground excavation that is deeper than it is wide and is no wider than 15 feet or 4.5 meters. Sloping involves cutting back the trench wall at an angle inclined away from the excavation. Shoring requires installing aluminum hydraulic or other types of supports to prevent soil movement and cavens. Shielding protects workers by using trench boxes, or other types of supports to prevent soil cavens. Designing a protective system can be complex because you must consider many factors. Soil classification, depth of cut, water content of soil, changes caused by weather or climate, surcharge loads, and other operations in the vicinity. Employers should also ensure there is a safe way to enter and exit the trench keep materials away from the edge of the trench, look for standing water or atmospheric hazards, and never enter a trench unless it has been properly inspected. Trench collapses or cave-ins pose the greatest risk to workers' lives. When done safely, trenching operations can reduce worker exposure to other potential hazards, including falls, falling loads, hazardous atmospheres, and incidents involving mobile equipment. 
To protect these workers, employers must think about preventing injuries and providing workers with the right equipment for the job. This webinar will discuss the following topics. Cave-in protection, competent person, other hazards in trenching, best practices, and resources. Trenching and excavation activities can be extremely hazardous when precautions are not considered for employee protection. Once the competent person has determined the soil type, OSHA has four options for employee protection from cave-in hazards. In the following slides, we will briefly review these options. To be designated as a competent person for trenching and excavation, the individual must have the knowledge and ability to recognize potential hazards, have specific training and be knowledgeable about soil analysis, and have authority to take prompt corrective measures. Experience alone in the area of soil analysis should not be considered sufficient for the role of competent person. Competent person means one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings, working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees, and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. The competent person must conduct daily inspections of the integrity of the trench or excavation, as well as inspect after any event that would jeopardize the integrity. The competent person must also immediately remove workers from any excavation upon discovery of anything that may present an unsafe working condition inside the excavation. Earth material removed during excavation must be stored at least two feet away from the sides of the excavation. Any excavation more than four feet deep requires atmospheric testing before workers are allowed entry. Excavations five feet and deeper require cave-in protection for workers. Workers required to cross over excavations with a drop six feet or more must be provided with a walkway and guardrail system. Any excavation 20 feet or deeper requires a registered professional engineer to design cave-in protection. A safe means of egress or access shall be provided and workers shall not have to travel more than 25 feet to them from anywhere inside the excavation. Competent person, trenching and excavation. The term competent person is used in many different OSHA standards and documents. For the purposes of OSHA's safety and health standards for the construction industry, an OSHA competent person is defined in 29 CFR 1926.32F as one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or working conditions which are unsanitary hazardous or dangerous to employees, and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. By way of training and or experience, a competent person is knowledgeable of applicable standards, is capable of identifying workplace hazards relating to the specific operation, and has the authority to correct them. Some standards add additional specific requirements which must be met by the competent person. 1926 subpart P in the construction standard uses a similar definition in 650B. Competent person means one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. This definition is further clarified in the preamble for the rulemaking on excavations, Federal Register 54-45909, issued on October 31, 1989. That preamble states that what constitutes a competent person depends on the context in which the term is used. In order to be a competent person for the purposes of the excavation standard, one must have specific training in and be knowledgeable about soil analysis, the use of protective systems, and the requirements of the excavation standard. One who does not have this training or knowledge is not considered by OSHA to be capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the excavation work, nor capable of taking the necessary corrective measures. 
By contrast, a qualified person or engineer, as defined in 1926.32L, might have more technical experience, but would not necessarily have expertise in hazard recognition or the authority to correct identified hazards. An important consideration in the competent person definition is the authorization to take corrective measures. Whoever is assigned the duties of competent person must be an individual that both workers and supervisors will listen to, respect, and act immediately upon their instructions or recommendations. There are many different facets of excavation and trench work that requires the utilization of a competent person. Daily excavation inspection prior to work, additional excavation inspections such as after every rainstorm and after changing conditions, monitoring water removal operations, exercising stop work authority if conditions become hazardous, evaluating structural ramp design, determining if excavations less than five feet need protective systems, inspecting materials and equipment, determining if any materials and equipment must be removed from service, and determining the need for emergency rescue equipment. One of the most important functions that competent person must perform is the excavation inspection. Inspections must be conducted daily and before the start of each shift as dictated by the work being done in the trench, after every rainstorm, after other events that could increase hazards, for example, snowstorm, windstorm, thaw, earthquake, etc. When fissures, tension cracks, slowing, undercutting, water seepage, bulging at the bottom, or similar conditions occur. When there is a change in the size, location, or placement of the spoil pile, and when there is any indication of change or movement in adjacent structures. What does a competent person need to know? The competent person must be trained, experienced, and knowledgeable on the following subjects soil analysis and classification, use of the different types of protective systems, and the requirements of 29 CFR Part 1926 Subpart P, Excavation Standards. The competent person must be able to detect conditions that could result in cave-ins, failures in protective systems, hazardous atmospheres, and other hazards including those associated with confined spaces. In addition to the duties required by the excavation and trenching regulations, there may be other activities that a competent person would need to have knowledge of or be able to perform. Duties such as general safety rules, i.e. PPE requirements and safe work methods, emergency procedures, ability to summon emergency medical personnel quickly, basic rescue requirements, and first aid CPR, not required by regulation but may be a best practice. And so employers have often asked, can a competent person have more than one role on a job site? The answer is yes, with certain conditions. In a letter of interpretation, OSHA has stated that a person who qualifies as a competent person with respect to one provision of subpart P, such as performing inspections, may also qualify as a competent person with respect to a different provision in subpart P such as the design of structural ramps. However, that person must be able to identify existing and predictable hazards and have the authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them with respect to the specific activity being performed. 
For example, under 1926.651C1I, a person is competent only if he or she is able to identify existing and predictable hazards with the design of structural ramps and has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. And so, whatever tasks a competent person is expected to perform, whether it is daily inspection, soil analysis, structural ramp evaluation, or other, he or she must have the necessary education, training, and experience necessary in that particular task in order to be deemed competent. Another common question asked, is does the competent person need to be on the excavation site at all times? The answer is no, but there are certain conditions that must be met. OSHA letters of interpretations have stated that it is not necessary for a competent person to be at a job site at all times. There is no blanket requirement that a competent person must be present at a construction job site at all times. The competent person can leave the site periodically, but it is the responsibility of the competent person to make those inspections necessary to identify situations that could result in hazardous conditions, such as possible cave-ins, indications of failure of protective systems, hazardous atmospheres, and other hazardous conditions, and then ensure that corrective measures are taken. It is also the responsibility of a competent person to ensure compliance with applicable regulations. Whether or not the competent person should be present at the job site is dependent on the conditions present at each individual work site. Consistent with these goals, the competent person may perform other duties. OSHA Technical Manual Section 5 Chapter 2 Excavations, Hazard Recognition in Trenching and Shoring Appendix 5 provides useful questions that a competent person should be able to answer if they are competent at preventing hazards in excavation and trenching operations. Is the cut, cavity, or depression a trench or an excavation? Is the cut, cavity, or depression more than 4 feet in depth? Is there water in the cut, cavity, or depression? Are there adequate means of access and egress? Are there any surface encumbrances? Is there exposure to vehicular traffic? Are adjacent structures stabilized? Does mobile equipment have a warning system? Is a competent person in charge of the operation? Is equipment operating in or around the cut, cavity, or depression? Are procedures required to monitor, test, and control hazardous atmospheres? Does a competent person determine soil type? Was a soil testing device used to determine soil type? Is the spoil placed two feet or more from the edge of the cut, cavity, or depression? Is the depth 20 feet or more for the cut, cavity, or depression? Has a registered professional engineer approved the procedure if the depth is more than 20 feet? Does the procedure require benching or multiple benching, shoring, shielding? If provided, do shields extend at least 18 inches above the surrounding area if it is sloped toward the excavation? If shields are used, is the depth of the cut more than 2 feet below the bottom of the shield? Are any required surface crossings of the cut, cavity, or depression? the proper width and fitted with a handrail? Are means of egress from the cut, cavity, or depression no more than 25 feet from the work? Is emergency rescue equipment required? 
Is there documentation of the minimum daily excavation inspection? Other hazards in trenching. Other excavation hazards that employers need to address. As we've seen, cave-ins are the primary hazard in excavation and trenching. However, there are many other hazards involved with trenching that are just as serious with regard to human safety. In this section, we will take a look at these other hazards and how to avoid them. Four key hazards involved with trenching, aside from cave-ins, are falling loads, mobile equipment, water accumulation, and hazardous atmospheres. It is important to be aware of each of these hazards so you can ideally prevent them from occurring or be equipped to handle them should they arise. First, let's look at falling loads. Equipment and materials such as tools, machinery, rocks, and other debris can fall or roll into a trench, injuring those inside the space. For this reason, loose materials should be removed from the excavation face by scaling. If any item must be kept near the site, it must be kept at least two feet from the trench's edge at all times. Another option to address this hazard is the installation of retaining devices at appropriate intervals to serve as barriers between the trench and loose items. While it is ideal to use both of these techniques simultaneously, you should use at least one at bare minimum. The next hazard is mobile equipment, which can strike individuals in the equipment's path. To prevent this from happening, a warning system should be in place whenever mobile equipment is used in or near the excavation, especially when the operator cannot directly see the edge. There are four types of warning systems that can be used in these situations. Hand signals, mechanical signals, barricades, and stop logs. At least one of these systems should be used whenever there is mobile equipment near an excavation site. Whether working near loose items or mobile equipment, one way to prevent injuries is to establish a rule that no one should work on faces of benched or sloped excavations at a level above another worker without adequate protection for the worker on the lower level. The person should be protected from sliding, rolling, or falling equipment that could be inadvertently set in motion due to the movement of the person on the higher level. Workers should also be prohibited from working or standing under any loads supported by lifting or digging equipment. Another way to protect workers from objects that may fall from mobile equipment is to require that all workers maintain a safe distance from vehicles being unloaded or loaded. This ensures that they will not be struck by falling items as they are loaded and unloaded or come into contact with any spilled liquids. Of course, this rule does not apply to the equipment operator who may stay inside the vehicle's cab during loading and unloading, as long as the operator is adequately protected under other OSHA regulations, specifically 29 CFR 1926.601 B6. Next, let's turn our attention to another key trenching hazard, water accumulation. The sides of an excavation can be undermined and weakened by water making it difficult or impossible for workers to vacate it. Needless to say, this is a highly dangerous situation that can lead to serious injury or even death. Because of this, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration prohibits employers from letting workers enter an excavation with accumulating or accumulated water without adequate precautions in place. Let's take a look at some of those precautions. Three ways to prevent water accumulation include installation of a water removal system to control the water level, use of a lifeline and safety harness, 
and use of a shield or special support system to prevent cave-ins due to water accumulation. It is important to note that if a water removal system is used, a competent person must monitor both the equipment and operation involved in the process to ensure it is working properly. In addition, if the excavation work interferes with the natural draining of surface water, special measures must be taken. Specifically, OSHA requires the use of dikes, diversion ditches, or any other suitable means to prevent the surface water from flowing into the excavation. The measures must also adequately drain the adjacent area. Furthermore, if an excavation is subject to runoff resulting from heavy rain, it must be inspected by a competent person and the excavation itself is subject to the rule that we just discussed about surface water. In other words, the rule applies whether there is existing surface water or potential runoff from rain. The last hazard we will cover in this section is hazardous atmospheres. Remember that excavations are unique spaces that may contain air unsuitable for humans to breathe. To prevent workers from being exposed to hazardous atmospheres, OSHA has set forth special rules. First and foremost, atmospheric testing must be conducted before any worker can even enter an excavation more than four feet deep when a hazardous atmosphere or oxygen deficiency exists or reasonably be expected to exist. A few examples of places where these conditions may be present are excavations in or near landfills and at sites near the storage of hazardous substances. If the atmospheric testing shows hazardous conditions do exist, the employer is required to take certain precautions. First, the space must have adequate ventilation to restore the atmosphere to acceptable levels, or workers must be provided with appropriate respiratory protection. Second, if controls are used to decrease air contaminants to an acceptable level, atmospheric testing must be performed as often as needed to ensure the air remains safe to breathe. Third, if hazardous atmospheres are present or may reasonably be expected to develop in the space, readily available emergency rescue equipment must be provided by the employer. This type of equipment may include a safety line and harness, basket stretcher, or breathing apparatus. If any of that equipment needs to be used, it must be monitored by someone aside from the user to ensure it is working properly. While OSHA specifically sets forth the rules we just discussed to cover atmospheres and excavation areas, it is worth noting that another OSHA section covers the same topic with regard to non-excavation work that may occur within a confined space at an excavation site, and some of the rules overlap. The other related OSHA section is the Confined Spaces and Construction Standard, 29 CFR Part 1926, Subpart AA. The two standards are designed to work in conjunction with each other to cover two separate hazards, the hazards that arise from working in the excavation itself and those that arise from working in confined spaces within that excavation. An example of how the rules may complement each other is that the confined spaces standard covers requirements for entry into manholes, storm drains, and other pipes even if they are situated at the bottom of an excavation site. As you can see, there are a number of hazards besides cavens that may arise during trenching and excavation. It is important to be aware of these hazards so you can prevent them from occurring and ensure a safe work site. This concludes the section on other hazards in trenching.
Next, we will cover several useful best practices to follow with regard to trenching and excavation. Excavation and trenching best practices. We have covered the hazards and the regulatory requirements. Now let's take a look at some best practices used by the best companies and workers in the industry. Before we get into any specific best practices for trenching and excavation, we need to go back to the basics and remember that by framing a good safety and health program using the three pillar approach, companies lay the foundation for success and safe performance. By focusing your efforts on these three key areas, management leadership, worker participation and engagement, and a systematic approach to finding and fixing hazards, companies can achieve and maintain improvements in their safety and health efforts on the job site. Here are some sample activities that companies can undertake in each of these core safety and health program elements as they relate to excavation and trenching. First, let's examine management leadership. Excavation companies can incorporate safety as a core value by starting at the top. Management should visit job sites to observe safety issues and ask for demonstrations of safety activities. Schedule regular meetings with employees using safety as their agenda. Attend safety and health training sessions. Attend job progress meetings with excavation buyers. Hold site management accountable for loss prevention as well as schedule and productivity. Write a safety policy statement explaining the value of employee safety. Develop a trenching and excavation program. Ensure adequate protective or shoring systems are available and used properly. Require documentation of site inspections by the competent person. And communicate with the excavation buyer concerning safety needs, such as establishing traffic patterns, arranging a first aid area, setting up emergency communications, and designating an area large enough for equipment and material storage. Next, we will discuss worker participation and engagement. Involve workers in your safety process by making sure that a worker's job description does not affect the level of participation in the company's safety program. All workers should participate in the safety process. Regardless of what duties a worker has, everyone is equally responsible for the safety process, from the person in the trench to the company owner. Peers should review excavation work in process. Estimators should participate in your safety and health committee. Employers should keep workers informed and ask for feedback and suggestions to improve their safety process by making safety an agenda item at the weekly meetings. This includes meetings with construction buyers, excavation contractors, site operation personnel, and company headquarters personnel encouraging workers to report safety concerns and solutions to hazards they identify, requiring a management response to all safety concerns that are raised by workers, and distributing safety alerts, creating bulletin boards, and maintaining safety signage. Designate a competent person in writing for each job site. Remember, a competent person has the ability and responsibility to recognize hazards and the authority to take corrective actions. The competent person should be on site to coordinate the safety responsibility for each job site and crew. Identify and provide workers with the training they need to do their job safely. This includes training for management. They should be aware of potential hazards and familiar with safe operation of all of the equipment used. For example, using the owner's manual for training on new equipment and incorporating it into the company's written safety and health program. 
Recognize employees for using safe work practices. Effective strategies include senior management publicly acknowledging employees for their involvement and contributions in the safety process. An active participation in a merit system for advancement. For example, promoting a crew member to a foreman, advancing a foreman to a superintendent, and a superintendent to a project manager, with safety performance being part of the criteria for advancement. Finally, let's talk about finding and fixing hazards. Each worksite must have a competent person assigned per the OSHA standards, but everyone should be trained to recognize hazards, act on hazards, and to report them. Here are just a couple of actions. Encouraging employees to report safety concerns and solutions to hazards they identify. And requiring a management response to all safety concerns that are voiced by workers. This all comes back to making safety a core value in your operations. So now let's look at more specific work practices that apply to excavation and trenching. Applying best practices should start early in the planning stages of a project. Do you have a pre-excavation checklist? Most excavators have a pre-excavation checklist which helps organize the excavator and reminds them of items needing attention. There is an assortment of tasks requiring attention before the excavator should move dirt. Do you know what they are? Here are some best practices to consider incorporating early on in your process. Assign responsibility for the pre-job safety processes. Efforts during this phase should include ensuring there is an appropriate emergency action plan to protect workers in case of a work incident, fire, electrical storm, hurricane, tornado, etc. Ensure your plan is specific for each job site and that it is well communicated to all workers. Ensuring you have a trenching and excavation program in place and that it is also well communicated and followed. Ensure there is a confined space program in place if it is applicable to the work being performed and that it is well communicated to all affected workers. Verify that the one call to 811 has been made and that all utilities in the work area are properly marked and their depth verified before commencing any digging activities. Ensure high visibility marking on all underground crossings and structures are completed before any work begins. Verify all overhead lines are identified and marked. Ensure a spotter is used if there are overhead power lines, underground utilities, or crews will be working in tight areas or in close proximity to heavy equipment. Ensure the availability and the use of appropriate protective equipment for the tasks being performed. Also ensure the public will be protected from work activities both during and after work hours. Properly identify potential sources of hazardous atmospheres and conduct appropriate testing. For example, yellow paint does not just mean natural gas. That is simply one of many gases that could be present. You need to know the potential hazards at the site. What can't you see, or what was the previous use of the site? Things that are unmarked can be a potential issue once you start digging. Think about neighboring sources, depressions, buried debris, and adjacent areas and activities. If the potential is there, include appropriate means to deal with the hazard and include appropriate rescue in your planning. Every job needs a competent person. Failure to provide a competent person is one of the most frequently cited OSHA violations. Another is that in terms both of legal compliance and avoiding job site accidents, it must not be assumed that experience and common sense equal competence. So what makes a competent person? Knowledge, skill, training, education, expertise, and authority.
During trenching and excavation operations, the competent person is a critical component of your trenching and excavation program and needs to be present and available at the work site. They should also be involved in the pre-planning. The competent person should inspect and document their inspections at the beginning of each day, at each shift change, and after every change of weather or any other significant event that could compromise safety during operations. They should examine the excavation as well as the protective systems being used, adjacent areas, and activities for their impact on the work site. No worker should ever enter any trench or excavation until it has been determined by the competent person that it is safe to do so, and that is in compliance with all OSHA, state, and local standards. Workers in and around excavations and trenches need to be made aware of the hazards and know the correct work procedures associated with trenching and excavation operations. Don't compromise worker safety. This includes following best practices. OSHA requires all workers and trenches five feet or more in depth, and in some states four feet deep, must be protected by a trench protective system such as sloping, shoring, or shields. When the depth of a trench is less than five feet, OSHA still requires the competent person to make a judgment call based on the conditions at the job site. For example, a vertical trench wall that is made up of a wet, sandy flowing soil and only three or four feet deep is dangerous and could cave in causing a worker to be injured. The competent person must take action to protect workers. You have a choice on which protective system to use, sloping and benching, shoring, or shields. This decision should be based upon the information gathered in your pre-planning process. Because sloping and benching requires no trench boxes or other shoring equipment, contractors often assume it is the least expensive method. However, the cost of removing soil and moving it away from the edges of a trench can be expensive and may exceed the cost of using trench boxes or shoring. This is particularly the case in long, narrow trenches such as pipelines, where shoring and trench boxes can be used over and over again as the trench is dug and filled, where sloping requires extensive soil moving along the entire length of the trench. If your company uses sloping as a protective system for trenches and an OSHA compliance safety and health officer visits your job site, they will measure the trench and determine the slope. So an inclinometer is the only accurate way to ensure the slope angle is equal to or less than the required angle for the soil type as shown here in the table. You can download an inclinometer app on your smartphone. By placing a straight rod or piece of lumber on the slope and then resting the edge of your device on the rod or lumber, you can easily determine the slope. Shoring and shielding systems are available from manufacturers in a variety of dimensions, usually aluminum or steel, or they can be custom built from tabulated data approved by a registered professional engineer. Shoring companies are required to provide tabulated data for all of their trench shield and shoring equipment. The tabulated data sheet stipulates the engineered restrictions of the device or system depending on the soil conditions. Only by carefully studying and understanding the manufacturer's tabulated data can the competent person choose the correct protective system. Here are some critical best practices. All shoring should be installed from the top down and removed from the bottom up. Hydraulic shoring should be checked at least once per shift for leaking hoses and or cylinders, broken connections, cracked nipples, bent bases, and any other damaged or defective parts. Personnel should be out of the box and above ground when the shield is being moved. Employees must remain in the confines of the box when working. Top of the shield should extend at least 18 inches above the level of any materials that could cave or roll into the trench. Some shields are designed to be stacked. 
Never stack shields that are not designed for that purpose. And do not stack shields from different manufacturers, as they may not be compatible. Forces of a cave-in can literally push a box sideways. After a box is positioned, voids between the box and the trench wall should be filled with excavated material to prevent displacement by a cave-in. Shielding should always be used according to manufacturer's tabulated data. One misconception is that excavations protected by one of the approved methods we have discussed, sloping shielding or shoring, are safe. Unfortunately, this isn't always true. OSHA's 10-year excavation study of fatalities showed that 24% of those deaths took place in excavations with protective systems installed but installed incorrectly. Just some final key points to remember. Workers should always remain inside the trench box when trench boxes are used. Ensure workers have a safe means of entry and exit, always readily available. Use multiple points of egress where the job permits and keep them as close to workers as possible without creating any new hazards. Never allow workers to work under suspended loads. Also, be aware of an excavator's swing area and blind spots. Always maintain a minimum of at least three feet of unimpaired clearance between the excavator's rotating superstructure and any adjacent objects. Keep others outside the area by marking it with rope, tape, or a similar barrier in accordance with your trenching and excavation program. Don't allow anyone to stand under a suspended load or the boom, arm, or bucket. Post warning signs that say, danger, stay clear, on all sides of the excavator. Keep the bucket as close to the ground as possible when workers are attaching loads. Lower the boom to a safe position with the bucket on the ground and turn off the excavator before getting off. Nothing brings a construction project to a halt faster than the discovery of a gas pipe, electrical line, sewer tile, or water pipe that nobody knew was there. These days, most utilities and property owners do a great job of recording what they put under the ground. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case. Gas pipes, sewers, and water lines from the early days were installed with little thought given to the possibility that someone might encounter them decades later. Utility lines used many years ago may have been bypassed by larger capacity, but nobody thought to go back and remove the old ones. There are steps you can take to minimize the risk of unexpectedly encountering underground utilities. It takes some extra planning in the early stages of the project as we discussed earlier, and a bit of additional investment, but that's a small price to pay when you consider the schedule disruptions such discoveries can create, or the cost of repairing the damage you created to a major utility line. Start by trying to obtain all of the drawings that may have been created for the area in which your project is located. That includes the plans for any previous structures, the utilities company's blueprints, drawings for past installations or renovations, or anything that may give you a clue as to what is below the surface. Compare the drawings to identify inconsistencies. As mentioned, call 811 and have the public utilities locate and mark all utilities. Make that call early in the process. As your project moves along, include underground utilities in your daily coordination meetings with the excavation contractor. Review the drawings with them and discuss strategies for working around the underground sites that have been identified. Develop a hazard analysis for each task that will be performed and identify measures to protect workers. One best practice is to begin by daylighting every utility in the area where they would be working. Place a piece of PVC pipe against the line and backfill it. That way, at any time during the work, crews know the exact location of the lines and can drop a measuring stick down the PVC pipe to get an exact 
depth. Make sure to keep good records of daily activities, including a log of dig numbers. That's important because if a problem with an underground utility line crops up, one of the first things investigators will ask for is the dig number. Set limits or tolerance zones in your trenching and excavation program for how closely excavating equipment can work from the marked line locations. And be sure to keep those markings visible throughout the project. Each state has its own tolerance zone, an area on both sides of an identified utility, which could be 18 inches to 24 inches on either side of the line. Each state also has its documentation and excavation requirements, particularly when excavating in the zone. Some require hand digging or hydro or vacuum excavation. Once underground utility lines have been exposed, take steps to ensure that workers know where they are to protect the lines from damage. If you need to trench around the lines, use trench shields to protect the walls of the trenched areas. Another best practice for working around underground utilities is the use of hydro excavating equipment as mentioned above. Hydro excavating combines the use of high pressure water with a vacuum truck to remove soils around the utility lines with minimal damage to the lines themselves. Before you do any work near high voltage power lines, notify the utility that controls the line before you begin. Inform the utility of the location, what work you will be doing, and when you need to do it. The utility may help you with tasks such as the following to ensure a safe operation. Coordinate work schedules, identify and provide temporary visual barriers that help prevent encroachment with the lines, de-energize and ground the lines, temporarily raise or move the lines. All overhead lines are identified and marked. As a best practice, use a spotter if there are overhead power lines, underground utilities, or crews working in tight areas or in close proximity to heavy equipment. Finally, in addition to the protective measures we have discussed, the appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE, must be available and used by workers for the tasks being performed. An assessment should be conducted and documented to determine what PPE is needed to protect workers from the identified and potential hazards. This includes gloves, proper footwear, appropriate hard hats for whatever overhead hazards may be present. Workers exposed to vehicle traffic will be provided with and wear high visibility garments. The presence of a hazardous atmosphere may require respiratory protection that is suitable for the exposure and the work environment based upon evaluation by the competent person. Emergency rescue equipment is available when hazardous atmospheres could exist in an excavation. Ensure workers are trained in the use and limitations of all of the appropriate personal protective equipment. The factors shown here illustrate the hazards that have already been discussed that can create deadly conditions for workers in trenches and excavations. Spoil piles, material, and equipment being too close to the vertical walls of the trench create surcharge loads, which increase the likelihood of wall collapse or caden. Additionally, equipment vibration, adverse weather conditions, groundwater, and even your operations can change the condition and classification of the soil, making conditions and the probability of wall collapse or caden, again, much greater. As you know from our earlier discussion, OSHA requires spoil piles, material, and equipment to be kept a minimum of two feet from the edge of the trench. But let's look at some best practices. There are several options to reduce the hazard of a cave-in. Remove excavated material from the excavation site. Another alternative is to move spoils, materials, and equipment out of the zone of influence. The zone of influence represents the shear plane or weakest area at which the excavation or trench wall will fall based upon the natural angle of repose for a material.
Although this angle varies by material, the slopes depicted here provides an estimate for the area that should be kept clear of heavy equipment or machinery materials and the spoil piles, unless the trench can be properly shored or shielded. Here are some other impacts or considerations that occur as a result of where you place your spoil piles. You increase the depth of your trench, weight of the spoils. Restricting the surcharge weight. By teaching operators, foremen, crew, and competent persons to calculate the weight of spoils based upon bucket size and by counting how many buckets are being located on the side of a trench, you can estimate and control the surcharge weight. For example, if the bucket is 0.16 cubic yard, then every 6.25 buckets is about 3,000 pounds. Using 80% of the allowable surcharge weight based upon the protective system used provides a safety factor in preventing trench collapse. And finally, Use properly installed shoring or shielding while still controlling spoils and activities around the excavation site. Anticipate and control surface water intrusion by other site activities as well as any natural or neighboring sources. Use control measures such as utilizing spoils to dam or divert the water whenever possible. Don't expose workers to an improperly protected excavation. When classifying soil, always ask, will it still be this class when we are done? If it is possible that the classification may change, then use protective measures for the anticipated class. Failure to do so may expose them to an improperly protected excavation. At the end of the workday, Ensure open excavations are properly barricaded and protected. Keep other activities or visitors far enough away by assuming the worst case soil, 1.5 to 1. An easy way is to determine the distance is using the finger and thumb method. If your fence or barricade is too close, you are exposing them to a potential of cave-in. Implement and follow your company's specifications for backfilling established in your trenching and excavation program. Ensure prior to backfilling that all equipment, materials, and debris have been removed from the area. Well, those are a few best practices for you to use in your trenching and excavation operations. Remember, by focusing your efforts on these three key areas, management leadership, worker participation and engagement, and a systematic approach to finding and fixing hazards. And implementing the standards and best practices we have discussed in this webinar, you can achieve and maintain safe trenching and excavation operations. There is a wide array of other resources available on topics involving trenching and excavation safety. Taking the time to explore these can increase your personal safety as well as the safety of others. To help facilitate this proactive approach to safety, OSHA has created a collection of resources to help employers with their workplace safety needs. These resources assist with the implementation of safety and health management systems and enhance their safety programs. Education and training is critical to all trenching and excavation programs. By educating all staff, employers can reduce injuries and illnesses. Visit OSHA's Safety and Health Topics webpage on trenching and excavation. The OSHA Training Institute Education Centers are a national network of nonprofit organizations authorized by OSHA to deliver occupational safety and health training to private and public sector workers, supervisors, and employers. These organizations are selected through a competitive process based upon their occupational safety and health training experience, and they receive no funding from OSHA. The OTI Education Centers offer courses and seminars on a variety of safety and health topics. The OTI Education Centers help to ensure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by providing training on hazard recognition and avoidance to workers, employers, and other safety professionals. 
OSHA's on-site consultation program offers free and confidential safety and occupational health advice to small and medium-sized businesses in all states across the country, with priority given to high-hazard work sites. On-site consultation services are separate from enforcement and do not result in penalties or citations. Consultants from state agencies or universities work with the employers to identify workplace hazards, provide advice on compliance with OSHA standards, and assist in establishing injury and illness prevention programs. Compliance assistance specialists in OSHA's regional and area offices around the country provide outreach to a variety of groups free of charge. These groups include small businesses and other employers, trade and professional associations, union locals, and community and faith-based groups. Compliance assistance specialists can provide general information about OSHA's compliance assistance resources and how to comply with OSHA standards. They are available for seminars, workshops, and speaking events. They also promote and help implement OSHA's cooperative programs, including the Voluntary Protection Program, the Strategic Partnership Program, and the Alliance Program. Here is a list of the Region 6 OSHA Training Institute Education Centers and their contact information. The OSHA Education Centers continue to provide outstanding training and outreach services, which helps OSHA achieve its mission of protecting America's workers. We thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. To report an unsafe trench, please call 1-800-321-6742.